That's always a pleasure to come to Elon. I don't think I've been here in about a decade, but I always enjoy my visits here. Um, and I hope that you will find my comments this evening to be useful and perhaps inspire some of you to support the measures that I'm going to discuss. Uh, the task that's always the most difficult is translating what one might think are good policy ideas into actual and implemented solutions. And the only way that that might happen is if there is a groundswell of support for these types of initiatives. And that groundswell of support has to come from us as the general public. So I'd like to begin by observing that the United States is characterized by a long-standing pattern of large structural racial inequality that has deepened further as a result of the economic downturn. Um, for example, in 2008, the median hourly wage for black male full-time workers was $14.90, while the median for their white male counterparts was nearly $6 higher at $20.84. This was a disparity that existed at the onset of the Great Recession. This wage disparity has actually widened subsequently, and it is not primarily due to differences in educational attainment. Even if you look at workers, within the same educational categories, disparities persist. For example, among workers with a high school degree or a bachelor's degree, black males earned only 74% of white, what white males earn. And among high school dropouts, black males earned only 61% of their white male counterparts. Also, nearly 90% of US occupations can be classified as racially segregated, even after accounting for educational differences. Occupations are distributed in such a way that black males are more likely to be crowded into jobs with wages 74% lower than the higher earning occupations from which they are largely excluded. Now, although there's been some improvement in the income gap that took place in the aftermath of the passage of the Civil Rights Act, uh, and that improvement continued up, a, up, up until around the mid-1970s, the employment gap and the racial wealth gap, two dramatic indicators of economic security, have remained extensive and stubbornly persistent. Um, and for example, again, if, if we go to uh, examine the unemployment rates, uh, we have a persistent situation in which the black unemployment rate is twice as high as the, the white unemployment rate. And I'm going to talk about this in a little bit more detail in a moment, because I think that there are some startling and striking dimensions to this, to this differential. Um, OK, so now, now this is the really stunning statistic. The joblessness rate, well, let me ask you, what do you think the, the joblessness rate is for black male teen high school dropouts? Does anybody want to speculate? 25%. Somebody, is that 25%? OK. 35. 35. Going once, going twice. So. Somebody said 50%. Would you be? Mildly stunned if I said it was even higher than that. OK, so the best estimate we have is attributable to research that's been done by an economist at Northeastern University named Andrew Sum, who finds that the joblessness rate for teen black male dropouts is 95%. Uh, OK, so I think that's. In a sense, that's a, it's almost a science fiction number. Right? And uh, it's a true indictment of the American labor market. Uh, if you add to some statistic the finding that blacks with some college education or an associate's degree experienced higher unemployment than whites who dropped out of high school, you can see this racial gap in unemployment I think, is a profound index of the degree of discrimination in the US labor market. 
Where there's unemployment, there is also imprisonment. Male high school dropout rate, dropouts of all races are nearly 50 times as likely to experience imprisonment as their peers of the same age who have a college degree. So uh, to some extent, those of you in this room have some measure of insulation from experiencing imprisonment. But for individuals who have not had the opportunity to go to college or who have not been able to complete a college degree, it's a quite different set of circumstances. So as I said, there's a link between unemployment and imprisonment. There's also a link between educational attainment and the greater likelihood or lesser likelihood of being unemployed. Uh, in, a in a 2009 study, uh, Andrew, Andrew Sum's Center for Labor Studies at Northeastern found that almost one quarter of all young black men aged 16 to 24 who have dropped out of high school are currently in jail, prison, or a juvenile justice institution. And these conditions should be an automatic call to arms, I would think, for dramatic social change to create substantive work opportunities for these young men, as well as others who are similarly situated. So the burden of unemployment weighs heavily on all young people, but joblessness continues to afflict black youth more than others. The Bureau of Labor Statistics estimates for June 2013 peg the unemployment rate for blacks 16 to 19 years of age, regardless of gender, at a staggering 46%. And the unemployment rate for whites in the same age range is approximately 22.7%. Moreover, the unemployment rate for adult blacks, as I said a bit earlier, has remained roughly twice as high as the rate for adult whites continuously since we first began to collect employment statistics about 50 years ago. At least as disturbing, the black rate is approximately twice as high at each level of educational attainment. For example, among persons 25 years of age and older in 2011, Blacks who had not completed high school had a joblessness rate of 24.6%, while the rate for whites with a similar educational attainment rate was 12.7%. Now, these are individuals of all ages. When we start talking about the teen black male dropouts, that rate becomes the, the staggering 95% that I mentioned a moment ago. Black adults who had completed high school had a 15.5% unemployment rate, Whites who had completed high school had an 8.4% unemployment rate. Blacks with some college education or an associate's degree had a 13.1% jobless rate, while whites had a 7% rate. Finally, blacks 25 years and older who had completed college had a 6.9% unemployment rate, while white adults who had completed college had a 3.9% unemployment rate. So the discriminatory climate is reinforced by two pieces of evidence. The first piece of evidence is, is embedded in the statistics that I just gave you, which indicate that the unemployment rate for blacks who have completed some college or an associate's degree is higher than the unemployment rate for whites who have not completed high school. Okay? That's, that's the first piece. The second piece of evidence that indicates what a discriminatory climate we have in American labor markets is a study by Princeton's sociologist, Diva Pager. She conducted a series of field experiments in Milwaukee and New York City. Now, we know that it's generally harder for ex-convicts to obtain work than it is for non-convicts of a similar age and educational attainment. But somewhat surprisingly, Pager found that the black male job applicants with no criminal record had a lower likelihood of receiving a callback for an interview than did white applicants who had been convicted of a felony. Racial discrimination underlies this country's severe racial, uh, severe racial employment gaps, but I would, I would submit that blacks are not the only demographic group struggling to secure employment. Young veterans particularly those who have served in Afghanistan and Iraq or both, return to civilian life with considerably lower odds of finding work, 
according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics data, the uh, veterans aged 20, 18 to 24 had an unemployment rate of 20% in 2012, higher than the rate for non-veterans in the same age group, which was about 16%. And these veterans are not alone. Just about everyone, I think, is having a fairly tough time finding work in the current economy. A 2010 New York Times story by Peter Goodman on the new poor indicates that even well-paid white professionals, once accustomed to six-figure salaries, have confronted long-term unemployment so extreme that they've depleted their personal savings, exhausted their eligibility for unemployment benefits, which are continuously being slashed anyway, and they have skipped on filling their medical prescriptions because of their financial situations. Jean Eisen, who at the time she was quoted in Goodman's article, had been out of work for two years from a well-paid professional position, observed, there are no bad jobs now. Any job is a good job. So I would argue that we do have a solution. And I'm going to contend that it's a fairly straightforward solution. Persistent eye unemployment has produced a crisis for virtually all Americans. And we can resolve the crisis by adopting a federal job guarantee for all citizens. This is a system of job assurance rather than unemployment insurance. And it is something that could have been implemented directly at any point by presidential authority under the mandate of the Full Employment and Balanced Growth Act of 1978. This is popularly known as the Humphrey Hawkins Act, and it is a law which has been consistently disobeyed by every administration subsequently. Representative John Conyers, Democrat from Michigan, has proposed a new bill, the Humphrey Hawkins Full Employment and Training Act, which could pave the way for full implementation of a federal job guarantee. The idea is the following. Any American 18 years or older would be able to find work through a federally funded public service employment program, which I've chosen to call, for want of a more exciting name, the National Investment Employment Corps. This basic idea has been endorsed by policy analysts as disparate as Kevin Hassett from the American Enterprise Institute and Jared Bernstein from the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities. And, and they too, truly do represent kind of the polar ends of American political discourse. Uh, so it's interesting that both of them have been supportive of this idea of instituting a program of direct employment inaugurated by the government. Each National Investment Employment Corps job would offer individuals non-poverty wages. Let's say a minimum salary of $23,000 a year plus benefits, including federal health insurance. The types of jobs offered could address the maintenance and construction of the nation's physical and human infrastructure, from building roads, bridges, dams, and schools, to staffing high-quality daycare centers subsequent to training. And of course, a training component would be important to equip employees with the skills necessary to fill state and municipal needs. The program would be cost-effective. Suppose that the program put 15 million Americans to work. That's the total number of persons who are out of work at the bottom of the current recession. Uh, and suppose they put each of those persons to work at a, the program put each of those persons to work at approximately fifty thousand dollars per employee. So this would be inclusive of salary as well as materials and equipment. And the salary scale would, of course, be adjusted upwards for people who had more managerial or supervisory positions within the, within the system. Uh, but say, say it was $50,000 per employee. Then the bill for the program, if we put 15 million people to work, would be $750 billion. Okay. In 2011, the total cost of the nation's anti-poverty program was programs was about $740 billion. But since the National Investment Employment Corps would function simultaneously as an employment assurance and an anti-poverty program, the existing anti-poverty budget could be slashed drastically with those savings going to finance the job guarantee. 
So this initiative would remove the threat of unemployment and provide a direct route to sustain full employment, particularly for those groups intensely struggling to find steady work. Young veterans, young people in general, blacks subjected to discrimination in employment, all high school dropouts, and especially black high school dropouts. While providing a particular benefit to those Americans in the most desperate straits, a universal job guarantee would meet the new needs of improving the economic security for all Americans. Okay, so that's, that's the first proposal. Okay. I, 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 I call these bold policies for economic justice, so let me give you another one. Okay. Um, in addition to a federal job guarantee program, I would recommend or advocate what can be characterized as a substantial child development account, or what Derek Hamilton and I have called the Baby Bonds Program, a phrase coined by the recently deceased scholar at Columbia, Manning Marable. Okay, a child development account. What, so it's, it's not truly a bond, it's more of an endowment or, a, or the equivalent of a trust fund. And the idea is the following. Uh, each newborn infant in our society would receive a government finance trust fund. Okay. And this trust fund would be graduated in amount based upon the wealth position of the family in, into which the child is born. Okay. So, for example, if, uh, you know, if, if for some reason uh, uh, Bill Gates and Melinda Gates had another child, or if Oprah Winfrey had a child, we give that child a $50 trust fund at birth. Okay. But for children who are born into families at the lowest end of the wealth scale, the trust fund amount would be fifty to $60,000. And this fund would be guaranteed to have an increase of a real, at the, at the, a 1% real rate of interest increase per annum until the point at which the child is eligible to draw upon this fund, which would be adulthood, age of 18. Okay. Uh, we could have uh, a situation in which, uh, in which this proposal could be designed in such a way that there were constraints or restrictions on what the individual child could use the fund for. You know, perhaps we would want to specify that it could be used exclusively for uh, for purchasing additional education, or it would be used exclusively for the purposes of financing the development of a, 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 a self-employment project, uh, a small business enterprise, or it could be used for assisting the individual in the purchase of a home. But you know that, that would be something that would have to be resolved later as to whether or not you would want to put constraints on what this could be done for, t used for. Typically, uh, when, when children in, in wealthy families receive trust funds, uh, I, I don't think that there are significant constraints on what they can use them for, uh, but uh, we can be paternalistic, particularly if this is government funds that are, are being put to, put to this use. Um, so why would we want to do this? Well, the advantages of wealth in our society are clear. Wealthier families are better positioned to finance elite independent school and college education, access capital to start a business, finance expensive medical procedures, reside in higher amenity neighborhoods, exert political influence through campaign finances, purchase better counsel if confronted with the legal system, leave a bequest and or withstand financial hardship resulting from any number of emergencies. Yet even among only white families, less than 10% of families hold more than 50% of total white wealth. And about 85% of black families have a net worth below the median household. So it's clear that the vast majority of the, nation's, of the nation's wealth, along with the associated opportunities stemming from control of this wealth, are skewed heavily towards a relative few who are predominantly white. <clears throat> now, given this strikingly uneven distribution of wealth and the importance of wealth in providing economic security, 
and enhanced life stances. A baby bonds program, I think, would represent a needed shift in public policy that could provide asset building opportunities for all Americans. And with wealth currently so unevenly distributed along racial lines, the baby bonds proposal could go a long way, not only towards reducing inequality in wealth overall, but go a long way towards eliminating the racial wealth gap. So the idea is to set up trust funds uh, for, for all newborns uh, who, who, are, uh, who are, are born in America on an annual basis. Uh, these accounts as probably, uh, as I suggested, could go from $50 to $60,000. Let's, let's say that the average account would probably be about $20,000. And since they would grow at a federally guaranteed annual interest rate, the accounts would be more substantial at the point in which the child becomes an adult and can make use of the funds. Now, program concerns around measuring family financial assets can be alleviated by modern electronic recording of financial data, which facilitates our ability to identify financial assets. Financial monitoring advances made by one of our favorite institutions, the Internal Revenue Service, as well as law enforcement agencies serve as example of, examples of the public sector's ability to measure financial assets, and many localities are already engaged in home value assessments. And indeed, we probably would want to make the assessment of family net worth on the basis of three to five years before the birth of the child so that we would have some record of what the, the, the typical status, financial status is of the family into which the child is born. And to avoid crowding out savings, the transfer program could be structured in a manner similar to the federal income tax or uh, in fact, income tax credit, the EITC program, which uses what I've described as a graduated or a phase out schedule to avoid work disincentives. Finally, uh, folks might have concerns that the program may influence the timing in which parents, grandparents, or other relatives or friends might make transfers to their offspring so that the children of these offspring can increase the federal, uh, federal trust fund. In, to which they qualify. And to address this type of moral hazard concern, the federal government could reserve the right to tax future transfers to baby bonds recipients. So if we have about 4 million babies born in a typical year, and they're all eligible for the program, uh, and, and, and the, average, the average amount of the trust fund is $20,000 in, in a given year, the cost of the program on an annual basis would be about $80 billion. Okay. That's actually not very much in the context of the American federal budget. Uh, so it would be $80 billion a year uh, that would be paid out for the first 17 years of the program. And then in the 18th year, there would be an additional $80 billion, or its equivalent for inflation adjustment, as well as the first wave of payouts of the now increased amount adjusted for the 1% uh, real rate of interest uh, that would go to the first cohort of kids who would be receiving baby bonds. So there, from, from the 18th year on, there would be two cohorts of, of kids who would actually be receiving payments. But the, the initial, uh, but the initial cohort's payments would actually be, already have been made except for the interest, real interest payments that would be added to the total, okay? Uh, so, uh, and, and so how might we fund this? Well, I would argue that this isn't really that expensive a program. It's, it's considerably less expensive than the federal job guarantee, but I, I I predicated the introduction of the federal job guarantee on the idea that we could offset its expense by reducing anti-poverty programs substantially. Okay. Uh, there are some other ways in which we might fund the baby bonds pro program. For example, it could be fully funded based on a fraction of what the federal government already spends on asset enhancing activities. 
A 2004 report by the Corporation for Enterprise Development estimates that the federal government allocated $335 billion of its 2003 budget in the form of tax subsidies and savings to promote asset development policies. The bulk of this allocation comes from items like mortgage interest deductions, exclusion of investment income on life insurance and annuity contracts, reduced rates of taxes on dividends and long-term capital gains, and the exclusion of capital gains from taxation and death. The total allocation, which is about 15 times higher than what is spent by the Department of Education, does not include subsidies or tax breaks given to corporations, nor funds from state and local level policies. An updated version of their report estimates the asset building allocation at close to $400 billion at the start of 2010, with more than half of the benefits going to the top 5% of the income distribution. At issue is not the amount that was allocated, but to whom the allocation is distributed, at least from my perspective. The top 1% of earners, those typically earning over $1 million a year, received about one third of the entire allocation, while the bottom 60% of earners received only 5%. If the federal asset promotion budget were allocated in a more progressive manner, federal policies could be transformative for low income and low wealth Americans. The baby bonds proposal provides a far more progressive opportunity enhancing strategy that is a lot less expensive program than many of the asset tax policies that are already in existence. So ultimately, public provision of a substantial trust fund for newborns, for families that are wealth poor, and the passage of a federal job guarantee would go a long way towards achieving what the American ideal should be. What I would describe not as a race blind America, but a race fair America. One that provides economic security and asset building opportunities for all of its citizens. I think that these two proposals would make a significant, significant, uh, uh, would create a significant opportunity for us to move in the direction of trying to pr produce not only greater racial equality in the United States, but greater equality across the board. I'll stop there. Um, and I'll, I'll be glad to try to address any questions that folks have. Yes? Um, don't you think uh, allowing everybody to go to college is going to change what's going to be needed to go to get the next job? So everybody goes to college, that's going to be standard. Don't you think that's going to be an issue? Um, yeah, I don't know that I said I was allowing everybody to go to college, although I would like to have that happen. Uh, what, what made you think that that was well, the case? Well, if you're providing funds of some sort, the trust, right? Yeah. Provide money for somebody to continue their education. Yeah. Wouldn't that enable them to attend college? Sure, it would enable them to. I'm not sure that everybody would choose to do that. But, I, if you, but if you set that as a new standard, don't you think it would just have the same level of Uh, no, I mean, if we have if if we had both the baby bonds proposal and the federal job guarantee in place, then regardless of the number of jobs that are generated by the private sector, there would always be an opportunity to receive employment from uh, from the National Investment Employment Corps. So, uh, so so the issue only arises if you don't do both of the policies and you only do the baby bonds policy. But then that raises a very interesting question because then we no longer could claim that the allocation of jobs in terms of numbers and in terms of quality of work was attributable into, in some way to who was more deserving on the basis of educational attainment. And uh, that would be a very different political environment in the United States you know, where those of us who have better paid jobs could not justify that exclusively on the basis of the claim that we've got better education than everybody else. So I, I'm kind of curious about how that world would look. I'd love to see it. But if you did both the baby bonds and the federal job guarantee simultaneously, then the issue that you're raising would, would, would not be a problem. Yeah? Uh, this is a question about, uh, were you pointing to me or someone else? No, I was pointing to you. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, this is about the baby box. Yeah. Um, uh, for giving out the money, is is this race blind? Is it? Yes. Yes, it's every every newborn infant in the country. And how do you how do you specifically determine how much money the baby gets? Based upon the family's wealth. Okay. Is it? No, I'm just wondering. Like, if you have someone that's slightly poorer than the other, would that be a substantial distance, or is it? No, it's graduated. Okay. It's graduated. So we, we avoid the, the notch effects that are associated with sharp discontinuities in the amounts of the payouts. Yeah. 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 So the, the baby bonds program creates this um, an idea in the United States that there's um, it's an equal opportunity that's given at the, at the end of the eight, you know, 18 years where they reach the right. But we know that the children would be educated for 13 years in a system that that's where, terrible. Well, <laughs> well where, the, where the personal wealth of a family has a lot to do with the type of education yeah. that's available. Yeah. And we know that that's the legacy of racialized housing policies that have allowed some Americans to accrue wealth in homes and others were yeah. sort of left out of that market. So we know that there's an unequal education to that point. Would that baby bonds program create the illusion of opportunity that doesn't actually exist because there's still inequality? Uh, that's, that's an excellent question. and. Um, you know, there's, there's another part of my life where I actually spend a substantial amount of time trying to think about the question of how we enhance education for everyone. And we actually have a project at, uh, at the Research Network on Racial and Ethnic in, uh, Inequality called Project Bright Idea, which uh, the, the, the premise of that is that our objective should be to provide gifted quality education for all students. Okay. Uh, I, I don't want to, you know, really dwell on that, but, uh, but, but, but you're correct. However, um, I think that there is a sense that people frequently have that greater educational attainment produces greater wealth. I think that's not really the case. I think that the primary source of wealth for most people is inheritance and in vivo transfers. Uh, in vivo transfers uh, simply means transfers that are made by the donor to the recipient while the donor is still living, unlike an inheritance. And, and actually, they're more important in some ways. Uh, I mean, any of you whose who's current education at Elon is being partially financed by your parents, you're receiving an in vivo transfer. Okay. Uh, so that's a very simple example. And other examples might be a couple that's newly married and their parents provide them with assistance in purchasing a home by putting up the money for the mortgage payment, the down payment for the mortgage. Okay, so, uh, so if, if that's the case, if the source, the source of wealth is not educational attainment in and of itself, then I think we are doing something constructive in terms of mitigating the degree of inequality if we provide each newborn infant with their own personal trust fund. Uh, but, but you are correct that there will be this other dimension of inequality that can play out, particularly in labor markets, in ways that uh, require us to address the educational system itself separately. Yeah. Yeah. Project Bright Idea have a website to blog, that has a blog or places to ask those questions that are on our mind or a place to a repository of Yes, uh, if, if you look at the Research Network's website, the Research Network on Racial and Ethnic Inequality at Duke, there is a link to Project Bright Idea. And uh, you know, if you want more information, uh, contact us and we'll be glad, be glad to provide it. Yeah. The, the jobs program, the question I have, the concern I have is, and you threw out the number 50,000, and I'm not sure that's what your, the salary is, but we have a lot of Elon grads who are going to be teachers. Yeah. They're going to make significantly less than that. So the, the, the salary that's the minimum was a salary that I set based upon the existing poverty rate. So I said $23,000. I said that the cost of hiring each individual would probably be closer to $50,000. But most individuals would receive this minimal salary, which would be about $23,000. Now, I, I agree with you that probably teachers aren't paid much more than that. I think that's a disaster. I mean, I, it's a social disaster. Uh, I have no idea why our country continues to pay teachers so poorly. And there's, uh, there are some countries in the world that have a very different attitude about that. Uh, the classic example that's now very popular in the media is the case of Finland. 
where uh, teachers are, are, are treated as professionals and, and are paid in a commensurate fashion. So again, that's, that's another issue. Uh, I, I don't know if we'd have teachers bailing out of teaching to take the public sector jobs, uh, but the other way to look at it is it might put pressure on school systems to raise teacher pay to make sure that they can retain the teachers. So, yeah. Um, what effect would all these policies have on the inflation? Because it sounds like this money is kind of, I mean, we're already $17 trillion in debt. So if you introduce the job guarantee, but you virtually eliminated large portions of the anti-poverty programs because of the anti-poverty function of the job guarantee, then it's, it's, it's almost a one-to-one -one offset. So there shouldn't be any significant net inflationary effect. And then the baby bonds program is really not that expensive, but then I also propose that there are some ways to finance that by uh, reducing the kinds of, of, of uh, upper, upper wealth strata bias redistributive policies that we already have in place. So there's a sense in which you could argue that neither of these programs would lead to any significant net increase in government spending. You look skeptical. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, at the beginning of your talk, you talked a little bit about how there's an inequality and um, presence of prisons between whites and blacks. And I was wondering if you think that these programs can help with things like drug use and um, imprisonment for whites versus blacks, because blacks are way more represented in prisons if it were to lessen the gap of. So, so I, I was thinking more about the notion that individuals who have served their terms have an incredibly difficult time finding employment. Okay. And that uh, the existence of a federal job guarantee would provide them with some assurance that when they come out of prison, having completed their, their sentences, right. that there would be work for them. Um, there's a training component that I have in mind for this federal job guarantee program. I'm not sure if we should extend that to think about various forms of therapies for the individuals in the system. That would make the program have another tier of expenses. Uh, but I, 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 haven't, I haven't really thought about that in, in as careful a way as I had about thinking about the training component. Mm -hmm. Good question. Yeah. Um, if the federal jobs uh, guarantee were to pass, would it be possible that it would be Explicitly, it would not just unemployed individuals, but also people who are employed below what you consider. It's, it's a guarantee for everyone. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so, so people could leave an existing job to take this job if it was a, if, if the conditions of work were, were, were better. And in fact, what you could do is you could get rid of the minimum wage tax because the, 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 the lowest salary and benefits for the federal job guarantee would then set the floor on what compensation would have to be. So there's been a lot of conversation lately about uh, low paid jobs, you know, people complaining about the conditions that some of these big box employers like Walmart provide with people. So you could argue that the introduction of this kind of program would be the best way to address the, the poor wage poor benefits conditions that are offered by many employers. Uh, so yes, I mean, it, it would be for everyone for precisely that reason. Yeah. Uh, I'm intrigued by the federal job program. Um, the thing that I'm uh, curious about is so many of the um, folks who are accessing the anti-poverty programs are women with small children. Yeah. And so how are you taking into account the multiple factors that are causing or contributing to their, their poverty when you're talking question. about child care, when you're talking about sick children having to be out of work for taking care of them. I mean, there's so and many That's a great question. And, and I think one of the things I mentioned is one of the array work, of possible yes. jobs was the development high of high quality yes. child care. Yes. And so I think yeah, but the reason for that is yeah. to address precisely this kind of concern. So you see that as folded into, into the job guarantee that well, some people's job would be to provide child care for other people but who would it participate. But would subsidized because if you're only making twenty three thousand, you can't afford. You don't. You don't pay for it. Okay. If it's, if that it's, would be part of the yeah. Thing. If it's a federal, if it's a federal job guarantee program, uh -huh. the service is paid for by the government. Okay. You don't have to pay something extra for it. Yeah. Has the um, 
the policy or the practice with some Indian reservations having sort of a trust fund for their 18, their, their students at the age, yeah. has it fed any uh, lessons to this proposal or to this idea? No, I, I, thank you. I, I, I wasn't aware of this. And it's, it's worth I don't know that every tribe does it. Are, they, are, these, are these tribes that have the casino, the casino fund? Casino okay, so there's a study by Randall Aki, A-K-E-E, -E, on the eastern bend of the Cherokee right. and the impact of the use of the casino funds on families. Uh, it, it, it doesn't talk about any kind of trust fund being established, but it talks about families receiving additional income as a consequence of the casinos. And it indicates that the, the kids' educational outcomes and health outcomes have improved, and the parents' health outcomes have improved. So uh, it, it, it's suggestive that there's, there's, positive, there's potential positive benefits. I think the real issue is whether or not the tribes actually do have significant control over the casino revenue. Uh, and in and, and the case of the Eastern Band, they do, yeah. but there are other cases where the, the, the tribal communities just really don't have much control over the revenue. Yeah. yeah. Um, along the similar lines, um, is there any way that you may um, advise um, to try this on a state level or a national level? Now, which one? The baby bonds or the job guarantee? Okay, so, so the, the, the trick with the job guarantee is <coughs> you would have to have stringent residency requirements if you did this at the municipal or the state level, right? Because otherwise, I mean, it would be quite sensible for many of us to migrate to the state that's providing the job guarantee. So that, that's one reason I thought this, this really has to be a federal program. But you know you could you could try it at a local level, but you would have to have some very strict residency requirements. Uh, with respect to the baby bonds approach, the state of Oklahoma is conducting an experiment. It's called the SEED program right now, S E E D, and it is essentially the provision of a trust fund for newborn infants. Uh, what's different about it from what we have in mind is that the amounts are considerably smaller. And we, we're thinking about, you know, a pretty substantial amount of money for the kids who are from the wealth poor, the, the most wealth poor families. But also, the Oklahoma program is one in which the families also have to make a payout into the trust fund. And, and our proposal that, that Derek Hamilton and I have been, been promoting is one in which there's no payout being requested or demanded from the families into this trust fund. So, but yes, there are some precedents for this, but they usually involve some kind of uh, arrangement where the families are, are having to make a payment and it's, it's complemented by public funds. Yeah. Your response to that just raised an interesting question about um, the federal job program and what that does to immigration policy and undocumented individuals living in the United States. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I don't have a really good answer. I mean, it's, there's a part of me that says that the complications with immigration policy have to be addressed separately. Uh, uh, where I'm nervous about this is if uh, employers are no longer able to hire people at, at low wages, that they will simply make their best effort to try to hire undocumented workers in those low wages. But I think that that still goes back to the whole set of issues that surround how our immigration policy operates, regardless of whether we have a federal job guarantee or not. But yeah, that, 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 that is a concern. Yeah. Yes? And what about for children like, if you immigrate and they become citizens, like, and, like, would they also have to be? Yeah, like, so any, any child that's born in the United States is an American citizen. What is it? Like, it doesn't matter. Any, any child born in the United States is an American citizen. So the, any American citizen would be eligible for the baby bonds. I mean, like, what if they were born like, outside the United States? Like, like, mm -hmm. Then they wouldn't be eligible for it. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you put a little historical context on the jobs um, initiative to the WTA and you know what worked there, what didn't work there, and how that was informed. 
So uh, that, that's a great question, and uh, you know, I'm sorry I didn't talk about that <laughs> earlier. Um, actually, it's the WPA and the Civilian Conservation Corps that are really the inspiration for thinking about this. Uh, what, what's a little bit different about them is uh, I think de facto they functioned as a, as a job guarantee, but they were not formally guaranteed jobs. Um, and, they, and it was also a program that was temporary. Uh, I, I'm not sure it was conceived of as temporary, but ultimately it was. Uh, by the 1940s, they had really wiped out both of those programs. Uh, and, and the idea here is that uh, that this is a job guarantee in the sense that every citizen is assured of finding work, uh, regardless of whether they have an existing job or not. And uh, it's not conceived of as a temporary program. It's conceived of as a permanent condition that would be introduced. But those are the, the, uh, those are the precedents from an American standpoint for a program of this type. Uh, I personally think that both of those programs especially the WPA, were fairly successful. Um, Kevin Hassett, who I mentioned, who's at the American Enterprise Institute, apparently the reason why he supports a program of direct employment is because his grandfather benefited from the WPA, and he's aware that it kept their family, uh, their, their, it maintained their family's well-being during the course of the Great Depression. So, uh, so, so, uh, so yes, I mean, I think that those are important precedents and they're very much, uh, very much inform this. Now there's some other precedents uh, which are less, less obvious to folks. So one is uh, India's Mahatma Gandhi Rural Employment Guarantee Program, which is a program, well the majority of the Indian population, India has a population of over one billion people. Uh, probably 65% of the population could be identified as being in rural areas. And there is a law that was introduced in the latter part of the, the previous decade that uh, establishes a job guarantee for all citizens of India who live in rural communities. Uh, and, and there's a lot of controversy over the efficacy of this program, uh, but it, it's being studied fairly closely now. The other case, a uh, program that I think has less ambiguity about its <coughs> success, is the uh, program in Ar Argentina called Jefes y Jefas, which provides a, gesundheit, provides a job guarantee for heads of households. And, uh, and so it's a little bit different from what we're envisioning since this is a job guarantee for everyone, but, uh, but the, the Argentinian program is family-based, and, uh, and, and appears to have been fairly successful. Uh, it was a response to the austerity period in Argentina, and, uh, and again, you know, it, it's, worth, it's worth looking at that also uh, for strengths and weaknesses in terms of thinking about how we might develop a program. Yeah, I'll make it, and then I'll Yes? But he already asked the question. Okay. Um, <laughs> so if, for the, um, the job guarantee program, if, if that, the benefits from, that, from having a job with that program are a lot better than a lot of benefits from minimum wage jobs, yeah. and the budget that you allocate is just based on the current unemployment rate, unemployment rate if people are... Well, no, actually it's not. It's it, not it was based on, I said 15 million people, which is the total number of people who were unemployed at the very at the bottom of the recession. But, um, so, so it, the, the program is, is actually what we used to call, I don't know, economists here, automatic stabilizers. Does anybody remember that, that phrase? Automatic stabilizer is a program that expands in periods of crisis and, and contracts during periods where you're having a greater prosperity. And that's exactly what would happen here. So in, in, in periods where the economy is in recession, then obviously there would be a larger number of people who would be put to work. But in periods where the economy is doing well, uh, and there are more good jobs and more jobs, then uh, the program could, could contract and it would be less expensive during those periods. So, yeah. Yes? So there's 75 million people at minimum wage right now, and if you pay them $22 an 
$20,000 a year minimum, or $22,000 a year, so I think that would affect If everybody switched from minimum wage jobs to a guaranteed job by the government, do you think there would be too many people in government jobs? Well, I, well, I, I don't, don't have a sense of jobs. What, I don't have a sense of what too many is. I mean, you know, if the private sector is not going to do the job, then somebody has to do it. But they're not all private sector jobs. The minimum wage job? Oh, the, not all the, that you're talking about? Yeah, now? that's the federal minimum wage. Yes, but you're saying that there, there's, there's, that, that people would switch out of those jobs, mm -hmm. right? And you said there'd be too many people in the public sector job. And I'm saying if the private sector won't generate enough good jobs, I don't care. You know, let's see if the private sector will. Maybe they will, and under conditions where there's some pressure on the private sector to actually have to generate quality jobs. I mean, the second part to the question is that if there's no motivation for somebody to attend high school and they can drop out of high school and are guaranteed a job, what's, what's the motivation to continue on to the education? Well, if you're talking about teens who drop out of high school having unemployment rates of at least 40%, when you know, it's not clear that there's much of a job opportunity for them right now. Right? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not sure what the motivational difference will be. Are, are we going to induce more dropouts? Yeah, that's, that's my question. How could, uh, given how high the dropout rate is, I, 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 I think that's, that's amazing. These are, these are low, these, these jobs are envisioned as being at the lower end of the scale. So if, you, if you're perfectly content to spend your life receiving a $23,000 annual salary, then yeah, maybe you, won't, you will drop out of, out, out, of, out of high school and go on and, and take a government job. Of course, we do have a training component, and we do have incentives that could be built into this program in terms of opportunities for promotion and advancement, which clearly could be tied to educational attainment. But, um, you know, I, I, I can't imagine that uh, the existence of a $23,000 job would dramatically change the incentives for individuals to consider dropping out, given how high the dropout rate already is. Just, I, I just don't see it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of like the argument that people want to be poor so they can get government benefits. Yeah, it's kind of the same argument. Um, given that everyone is guaranteed a job, if say someone were to not go to work for a month, or they don't get paid, very poorly, they don't get paid if they if they don't show up to work. I mean, you have to you have to at least punch a clock. So they would just be guaranteed the opportunity to get a job, but it doesn't guarantee that they will. It doesn't guarantee them an income. No, it guarantees them work work for pay. Yeah. Now, there's some people who say we should just guarantee people an income. Okay, they, I mean, I've, I've heard that. I'm not hostile toward the idea, but I kind of like the idea of, I think there are tremendous social benefits that we could get from having a program where we address the nation's infrastructural needs so that there's a benefit from the work itself. And so uh, I think that's what I think. Yeah? Uh, would the jobs uh, under the program, would they? Be expected to be permanent once the people took them, or would people? No, people could move to different jobs if, well, if they mean, had the requisite. <coughs> I mean, would people be encouraged to move back to the private sector if they wanted to be itself? That would be up to the individual. Okay. That'd be fine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, would there yeah. be job training available along with this program at all? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for example, you know, one of the things we I'd be hoping people would be doing is assisting in repairing and maintaining our bridges. And you know that, that requires a certain level of skill to work on. So we, we would have to train people to do that. I mean, that's, that's what they did during the Works Progress Administration. They, they trained people uh, to do that. They also tried to match people's previous skill level with the type of work that they were doing. So in fact, we had artists who were painting these phenomenal murals under the Works Progress Administration, so yeah. Yes? Uh, yes, for the baby bonds program, do families with, um, well, that don't have family structures with a married household, are they not um, entitled to this fund and also other I'm consequences? Sorry, I, I, 
You can't hear me? Every newborn infant is entitled to a, a trust fund. Okay. Regardless of whether or not his or her parents are married or whatever. And do they? But we would have to design some way of systematically determining what we construed as the relevant family for estimating the wealth of the family. Okay. Yeah. And would they lose um, rights to this money, say, if they come from a low income area and they are involved in criminal activity before the age of 18? Like, do you think it's fair for, I don't know, criminals to, I don't know, continue the same behavior? and so, get that amount of money from lower income areas at a young age, I, like 18. You, you, could, you could impose a constraint on the program where if, well, if, if it's before 18 in most states, you're in the juvenile justice system, which is not quite, it's not supposed to be quite the same, but, uh, but you, could, you could impose a constraint that if an individual had been convicted of some sort of crime, that they could not have access to the funds until after they'd served their sentence or something like that. I don't know. I certainly wouldn't want to say just because somebody had been convicted of a crime, they couldn't have access to the funds. But a certain right? That's sort of our, the way in which we treat a lot of people's right to vote in many states, right? Is that regardless of whether or not they've actually served their term, they, if, if they've had a criminal convention, we don't let them vote. I think that's, that's crazy. So similarly, I wouldn't want to try to impose a condition like that on recipients of the trust fund. But we could delay their receipt of it until after they'd served their sentence. Okay. I'm, I'm also, I'm fascinated by both of these programs. It seems to me that you would find, and I'm curious what the response has been, more political will for the jobs program than the baby fund. It's a, that's interesting. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, the baby bonds program in, in, in truncated form actually was implemented in the UK for about 10 years, and then they discontinued it. And how, what, were the, what were the results? So we, we still don't know because they discontinued they it two years ago. So oh, okay. yeah, there are no payouts right, yet because right. the kids are too young. Uh, and we don't know what the consequences have been. Uh, w well, there are some studies trying to look at whether or not there, there are effects of, of families knowing they have this fund. Okay. But, uh, but Julian Legrand at the London School of Economics is the primary person. He's, he's partially the person. He's, he was an important architect of this program, and he's also trying to assess its effects. But they, they discontinued it. I think they discontinued it because under, uh, under dent of, 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 of budget cutting mania, there was not a significant constituency of support for the program since it was introduced from above rather than from below. Uh, and so, uh, so I, I guess if I was trying to think about how we would bring about either of these proposals from below, I, it, it may be easier to build support for the job guarantee than the baby bonds proposal, but I'm not entirely sure. I guess I'm just thinking in terms of sort of rhetoric around uh, social programs yes. and social support, and you get, you know, I mean, personal responsibility, work opportunity. Yeah, I mean, we're really good with Absolutely. work. Absolutely. We're really good Absolutely. With, with, with saying if people are working, then they're, they're deserving. They're deserving. It, it, actually, it actually stuns me that some people who uh, who are are strongly complaining about uh, the welfare systems, disincentives for work, et cetera, do not jump on the bandwagon with this proposal. Because this is a proposal that would let you know who really doesn't want to work, okay? I mean, this is a zero unemployment rate proposal, okay? So the people who would not be working were folks who really didn't want to work. There you have it. Yeah. But, but the, the baby bond seems to play into more of those cultural tropes around getting something for nothing. 
Yes. Which I think yes. can be really, really. Even though really rich people, for the most part, have gotten something out of it. But yes. <laughs> but, but I think it's harder to fight those politically because of the way. Um, Although, you know, there's a sense in which, you, you know, when people talk about level playing field, this, this, this is very consistent with trying to create a more level playing field, mm -hmm. particularly since you're giving the funds to newborn infants who bear no responsibility for the pre-existing conditions of their families. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, let's, let's talk a moment about the political context and what you've been facing and the pushback, um, how these policies have been met yeah. when, they, when you present them to politicians. Well, uh, so this may be the more most receptive audience among politicians, <laughs> but uh, the Congressional Black Caucus has endorsed the uh, job guarantee proposal. It endorsed it in 2011. Uh, I don't know. I, I I'm not really sure why this doesn't have even more traction. I mean, is it being, but I, I mean, I, it's so many times in your talk, you can imagine people who are in the middle of Obamacare, in the middle of this fear of big government, right. and saying, here's one more massive, I mean, this would be a massive program. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and but, not trusting the government to carry it off very well. Certainly. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's a potential reaction. Um, and, and that's why I, I emphasize in some of the work the importance of examining precedents and what were the problems and what were the successes to make sure that the program would be crafted in such a way that we paid close attention to how best to do it. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's certainly a, a legitimate concern. Uh, but uh, but I, I think most of the pushback has not been around the question of the effectiveness of implementation but just the sense that, well, you can't do that. And, and, and you know, I, I say, well, why not? <laughs> I mean, in fact, we've done it. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. The one puzzle that keeps rolling in my head is if, if you make decisions based strictly on class, economic class, yeah. Human beings are so creative. I, I could I could see the racial disparities occurring within the program. I could in my mind I could just see us. So you're saying that you, within the job program right. that there, there 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 would be a hierarchy of positions and yeah yeah, yeah. yeah so Sorry. I just certainly yeah. certainly that's possible yeah, yeah. Uh, because we got a good track record of that. yeah we do have a good track record <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and again that would be something that we would want so to be. Alert to and monitor. So, so I'm thinking weighted points. So here's, so here, you know, just not sure how to address it. But knowing weighted points. So like, it's like affirmative action within the yeah. job yeah. here. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but, but certainly we'd have to think about L the question. Human nature. Yeah, the question of, of groups gaming the gaming the system. Well, I can't think of a better way of marking the 50th anniversary of Johnson's introduction of the War on Poverty, which is today. Um, so thank you for bringing us to the great